Well, thank you, Bradford Festival, for inviting me. And I can feel instinctively it will be a very exciting festival. When I was invited on this occasion uh, by the Bradford Festival to say a few words on Bradford, I had to think hard. And suddenly, I remembered myself as a 16-year-old in Guyana, what was then called British Guyana, where there was a colonial educational system. The books you studied were set by Oxford University. I didn't have a um, GCSE. My exams were called O-level. O-level, meaning ordinary level. And then you go to sixth form and you spend two years. I did the arts. In those days, you had to choose between the arts and the sciences. I wasn't keen on physics and chemistry. I was allergic to Bunsen burners, terrified by litmus paper, but loved language. It was a Roman Catholic secondary school, St. Stanislaus College in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. We were doing exactly the same syllabus as six formers in Britain at that time. I'm speaking of the late 60s. So imagine me as a Guyana-born 16-year-old being taught by Jesuit priests, but one of our teachers, who wasn't a priest, a wonderful human being, Michael Jilks, a playwright, a poet, wonderful teacher, who sadly died last year because of COVID. And he is a human being that touched my life. He was teaching us James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man. From his lips, I first heard the word epiphany. He was teaching us T.S. Eliot's poetry, which I suddenly went back to because I was doing this contribution to the Bradford Festival. And Eliot speaks of a house clerk, you know, with that bold stare as a silk hat sits on a Bradford millionaire. Think about those lines, as a bold stare, blah, 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 as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. It makes you think about poetry. I think it was W.H. Auden who said that um, a poem can communicate even before it is apprehended. So as a teenager growing up in the Caribbean where I'm hearing calypso music coming through the radio, where I'm hearing cricket in the voice of John Arlott, where I'm going to the market and I'm hearing Caribbeanized English, Creole, some people say Patwa. The Barbadian poet Kamau Braffitt speaks of nation language. We are getting all of these registers of speech. I didn't stop to question my teacher, sir. What does this poet mean by Bradford? Never dawned on me. I responded to the musicality of this clerk, this house clerk, who has this bold stare as a silk hat sits on a Bradford millionaire. Forty years later, I find myself a published poet. I find myself on the GCSE exam syllabus. 
I'm going to Bradford to do a reading at St. George's Hall. The organizer tells me there's a part of Bradford called Millionaire Row. And that I'm experiencing Bradford. That word I, d I came across 40 years ago. And then I do a bit of research and I discover that Bradford was in the forefront of the textile wool trade. I seem to remember an interesting um, bookshop, even Waterstones in Bradford. I seem to remember it was in Bradford, a nice old fashioned building that's, you know, part of history. And then I got invited by Melanie Abraham, founder of Tilt and Renaissance, to take part in a celebration of the Bronte sisters in Howard Village. The obvious question, how do I get there? Never heard of it. Melanie says to me, well, John, go to Leeds, and then you get a train about 20 minutes. You'll come to a place called Kylie. Jump in a taxi. I did as I was told. Get to Kylie. It seemed very industrial. And after a short taxi ride, I'm in this very atmospheric English little villagey type of tongue, like something out of an ancient time. They put us up in the attic of an old pub, creaky wooden floor, old beams, beautiful food, cobbled streets within a stone straw of the Yorkshire Moors. And I didn't realize that Howard is part of Bradford because you think of Bradford as city. Interestingly, those teenagers who might have been born in Bradford, I strongly recommend you read an essay by Hanif Kurishi, an important British Asian voice. I think he was in fact born in Kent, but he writes an essay on Bradford and the potential richness for diversity and cultural magnetism. Doing a bit more researching and a bit more googling, I learned there's a place called Dub Hill. I hope my pronunciation is right. Also part of Bradford area. From what I've read, in Dub, in Dub Hill, you tended to have um, Polish immigrants and Irish, especially in the days of the flourishing wool trade. And as we speak today, providing the book is up to date, there's a Muslim mosque not far from the old Roman Catholic Church. I grew up a Roman Catholic. They thought I'd even be a priest. It was part of my sort of exposure to language as a poet. I'm hearing that soothing voice of John Arlott. And as an only child, I'm listening to cricket commentary. I'm reading Enid Blyton, The Hardy Boys. I'm excited by words. I'm enjoying taking part in plays, debates, pretending I'm a commentator, the way you teenagers might pretend you are a rapper. 
perhaps. And I'm hearing Arlott say, the bowler, in those days it wasn't um, Anderson, it wasn't Stroud Broad, it was Freddie Truman and Brian Statham rubbing the ball on his flannel, the batsman forward defensive gingerly along the carpet or sweeping majestically. I'm learning words, words. I read Enid Blyton and she loves to use words like flabbergasted, consternated. So as a 13 year old, I've got to show off these words. So when something is um, absurd, 13 year old me says, that's preposterous. I'm no longer surprised. I am flabbergasted. I am consternated. Some years ago, a Trinidadian painter and poet by the name of John Lyon, he lived in Hebden Bridge, and I'd forgotten I'd written a poem, and I called it Caribbean Eye Over Yorkshire, because his paintings had some very intriguing figures looking like blackbirds, but they were most likely what we in the Caribbean call carrion crow. Um, Jamaicans call that bird John Crow. So as I saw those blackbird figures, those carrion crows, those John Crows, I connected them to the crows of Ted Hughes, the Yorkshire-born poet. And to come back to another Yorkshire collection, uh, connection, when Melanie invited me to write a poem inspired by the Bronte sisters, because just next to the pub where we stayed, and then over the road, there was another pub. I think it might have been called the Old Bull. Can't quite remember. But Patrick, the, the brother, would go there and drink. And then you've got the parsonage where the father was a vicar. And then these three sisters create classics which are part of the British canon. I use that expression deliberately, the British canon. But let us cast our minds to that wonderful mind of Edward Said the Palestinian critic. I like to think of Said as a Renaissance man, knowledgeable of literature, a political essays, wonderful insight into music. He was a great friend with the Jewish composer and pianist Daniel Baron Boim, who was married to the cellist Jacqueline Dupre, and they organized concerts between young Palestinians and young Israelis. And he was the one who drew to my attention that Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, posh, English type, shall we say, country house, where was that money funded to maintain that almost pastoral bliss because of slave plantations in Antigua? I wrote a poem. And when we did that special Bronte celebration due to Melanie's Abraham's proactive thinking, an actor recited from the autobiography of Equiano, a slave who gained his freedom and went on to be a spokesperson 
for abolition, spoke to miners, spoke to the north of England, married a woman from Cambridge, where their young daughter lies buried in the soil of Cambridgeshire, an early mixed race child. And during that day, as people walked around, following us around Howard, town, stroke village, not far from Kylie, part of your area, Bradford. And having read this book by Corinne Fowler, Green on Pleasant Land, it's an eye-opening book. The Brontes had neighbors who owned the slaves. And there was escapes, which meant that the Bronte sisters, living in that cocooned world of a parsonage with a vicar for a father, would have been aware on the grapevine there's a slave on the run. These sisters wrote classics on a mahogany table. Yeah, a mahogany table. You could probably buy one flat-packed in the self-assembly from Ikea or Home Base or B&Q, take your pick. But at that time in the 19th century, mahogany was a status symbol. Some people having a big party would actually hire or rent a mahogany table to impress their guests. You can pop into a supermarket and buy a pineapple. Huh. Good for you. We are talking the 19th century. You know, a pineapple was also a status symbol. This is why many houses, I'm sure if you went along Millionaire Row in Bradford, I no doubt it still exists, I presume, Millionaire Row, you will see pineapples as a kind of um, decorative feature on the gates. Pineapple was described as the king of fruits. It was a status symbol. People hired a pineapple to put on their table just to display and impress their guests with their wealth. So after I celebrate the Bronte sisters and give them their due, remarkable to be writing novels that would become classics. But as a Caribbean poet, I have to find a different way. I'm not just out to write a poem with due respect simply to the Brontes. But it's so easy to forget that that mahogany table had an embryonic birth in the forests of Jamaica. And the mahogany forests were being depleted. Charlotte Bronte said something very interesting, and I gave it my own twist. But it's mainly her words. Prejudice settles in the soil of the bones, taking root as firm as weeds among stones, unless loosened and fertilized by an education that sees in common human ore, the soul's hidden diamond. But then I go on to touch on that mahogany. Meanwhile, the gleaming ghost of mahogany keeps vigil in what is known as Bronte country. Mahogany 
resigned to being a writing desk, still feels in the shine of its veins the memory of how gods fall when a forest is ravaged. If Jamaica's Suitenia Mahogoni grows extinct here in Howard Village, Mahogany Cradle's page, an inspired pen about to be dipped into ink, but in the dark mirror of a mahogany desk, no intrusive ghosts from a colony dispossessed, only a flickering candle, the silent sentinel to the burnt pangs of a classic in progress, and back to musing in a Victorian chair, Charlotte sits, polishing her gin ear, who will direct a blind and troubled gent towards her own soulmate light, one Rochester. But Charlotte's thoughts are beyond the bestseller. Now, all of you who pass that hilltop parsonage, pause a while in what is known as Bronte country. Not far, a black body once made a run for liberty. Take heed, Taurus. Centuries later, you might be the one who hears these moors speaking in a plural tongue. Reflect on those lines. These moors, speaking, I almost forgot it, speaking in a plural tongue. Those of you who remember Kate Bush, like a, like a siren out of mythology, balleting her way, iconically, O Katio Katio, in that song, so memorable. You can see Yorkshire, Howard, Bradford, in the context of modern culture. But let me say one thing, and I think Bradford could lead the way in this. Coming from Guyana, in a multiracial society where we have the original inhabitants, the Amerindians of Arawak ancestry, of Carib ancestry. That's how you get the word Caribbean from the indigenous Carib people. The people who discovered Columbus. Why not? Who writes the history books, wields the power. Who writes the history books, use the language. As that African proverb said, not until the lion begins to write its own history books will we have a different view from that of the hunter. Guyana, called the land of six races, Amerindian, African, East Indian, with roots in India, Chinese, Portuguese, 
My own grandfather came from Madeira. Columbus had a nice mother-in-law. She showed him the diaries of her dead husband, who was a famous mariner. So Columbus read his father-in-law's diaries. Columbus saw sugarcane growing in Madeira and introduced it to Hispaniola. Sugarcane, the crop described as bittersweet. Europeans. In Guyana, we separate Europeans from Portuguese. The Europeans are seen as like white expatriates. The Portuguese, who were part of that whole transatlantic uh, brutality of slavery and indentureship, like my own grandfather from Madeira, that's how you get the six races, Amerindian, African, East Indian, Chinese, Portuguese, and the European. But let me say something. Growing up with a Portuguese mother and a Roman Catholic and going to Roman Catholic schools. When we have Christmas, it's a national holiday. When we have the Hindu festival, Diwali, it's a national holiday. When we have Eid ul Azha, it's a Muslim and a national holiday. And I've said this again and again. If Britain had Eid ul Azha as a national holiday or Diwali, it would be an amazing input into the diversity mindset of people. I'll tell you why. When my Portuguese mother sees her Indian neighbor having beautiful devas, lighted bowls at their gate, my Roman Catholic mother, she doesn't want to be left out, she puts some fairy lights at the gate. People might be black, Chinese, and when it's a national holiday, they say, what's this all about? Why are the houses so beautifully lit up? Why, I'll tell you, it is Diwali, the festival of lights. Can you imagine if Britain had Eid ul Haza, and suddenly the schools are closed. It's a bank holiday, and the young generation, a six-year-old British white child living in the middle of Cornwall. Mommy, there's no school. Why? Well, darling, this is a, apparently a bank holiday. It's a Muslim festival. It's Eid ul Azza. Mommy, can we have some lights? Like my friend down the road. They came from India and they've got a lovely looking garden full of lights. Can I put some lights in the back garden? Yes, darling. Why not? I see no harm. It's Diwali. And then you buy a Diwali card and you send to a friend. It becomes part of your DNA, your cultural DNA. It's no longer something exotic. Oh, apparently the Muslims are celebrating Eid. Oh, apparently the Hindus have got a festival. No, it becomes part of a British mindset of plurality. And this is why I will simply end by repeating those lines that bring me right back to Howard Village, which is part of Bradford. I didn't realize that. So from that texture of a broad mix of people, you in Bradford and you teenagers have the possibility of developing quite naturally a plural mindset. All you who pass that hilltop parsonage pause a while in what is known as Bronte country. Not far a black body once made a run for liberty. Take heed 
tourists. Centuries later, you might be the one who hears these moors speaking a plural tongue. Thank you, Bradford, and I hope you make great creative use of your tremendous human resources. Thank you, Bradford. Thank you.